Thank you, Governor, and thank you, Julia, Maria, and Lisa, for being here with us today. Certainly the priorities we just heard on that panel, preserving the Medicaid expansion, adequately funding education, and sensible yet and effective uh, actions taken to address global climate change have long been priorities for the business plan. And the concept that everyone talked about on stage in the last panel around partner, the business uh, community partnering uh, with legislative, civic, and community leaders uh, to develop real and effective solutions for our state was the uh, idea behind the business plan originally and has continued to drive the business plan since 2002. It's an honor to introduce our next session with our two U.S. Senators, Senator Ron Wyden and Jeff Merkley. Uh, Senator Jeff Merkley, neither really need introduction, of course. Uh, our senior Senator Ron Wyden is the ranking member of the Finance Committee and serves on the Natural Resources Committee both assignments, of course, of keen interest to Oregonians. Senator Wyden has served in the Congress since 1980 and as our senator since 1996. The senator launched this summit in 2002 and has never missed one over 16 years. Senator Jeff Merkley is serving his second term as our senator. He serves on the powerful Appropriations Committee along with other important committee assignments. Born in Myrtle Creek, he's a lifelong Oregonian with a long and distinguished career of public service, including serving as Speaker of the Oregon House of Representatives. The Senators will be interviewed by Monica Nan, CEO, President, and Founder of Zapproved, one of Oregon's most successful software companies. Monica has a long history in the technology industry, working for tech giants Intel and IBM before starting Zapproved in 2008. She's not only a success in business, but community service is also in her blood. This year, she was the first recipient of the Sam Blackman Award for Community Service. Please welcome to the stage, Senators uh, Ron Wyden, Jeff Merkley, and Monica Anand. Oh, well, good morning, Senators. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Patrick, for those wonderful introductions. So if the past is any pro uh, prologue, I assume it's safe to predict that Washington, D.C. is going to be a bit contentious this year. Uh, however, in the spirit of the season, I'd like to ask each of you what you see as the biggest opportunities for constructive progress in 2019. Well, first of all, it is great to be back for the 16th summit. <laughs> and yeah. like, like every teenager, <laughs> the summit is poised for growth. <laughs> and what I'd like to do, because I think we're going to try and move pretty quickly, is touch on four areas where I think federal policy could be useful for Oregonians coming up, apropos of your question. The first is, we all know the Friday after Thanksgiving, the federal scientists came out with a blockbuster report that Oregon would get hit like a freight train from climate change. And it would hit key industries, agriculture, uh, forestry, recreation, fish, the list goes on and on. All the aspects of this report said urgent business. So I wanted to start by way of saying that I think changes at the Senate Finance Committee are going to create an opportunity for us to do some bipartisan work redoing the federal tax code as it relates to energy in a way that could help us attack climate change. Right now, billions of dollars go out every year for oil companies. Five billion for the oil industry alone, four billion more for something called the Lone Star Provision at the end of last uh, uh, session. And what I'm going to propose is we take all 40 provisions of the tax code that relate to energy and throw them in the trash can. <laughs> and we would substitute for the 40 provisions, one for clean energy, one for clean transportation, electric vehicles, for example, and one for energy efficiency. It would cost us half as much, so the Republicans will like the lack of subsidies, we'll get more green for less green, simpler science policy 
That's number one. Number two, about 20 years ago, I wrote a bill called the Secure Rural Schools Law. It's brought Oregon almost $4 billion for schools and roads and basic services. Still, everybody in this room knows rural Oregon is really hurting. And we need a better, more predictable approach. So Republican Senator Mike Crapo and I have been working to come up with a replacement that would create an endowment independent of yearly politics that would support sound timber management and increased revenue for the counties. So that's priority two for bipartisan constructive work. Priority three involves infrastructure, roads and bridges. We have the good fortune of having Congressman DeFazio. He will be chairman of the House Committee on Transportation. He will send Senator Merkley, in my view, a good bill. One of the things the conservatives want in a transportation package is a role for the private sector, a role for private investment through bonds. I wrote the Build America Bonds program in 2009. We sold $180 billion worth of them, and I've got a Republican sponsor for a new version in 2019. And finally, finally I want to talk about housing because whether you're in Paisley or Portland, there's a tremendous housing crunch. And I'm here to tell you, housing policy needs a major remodel. And the model that I'd like us to build around is the low-income housing tax credit. It's been bipartisan. I'd like to expand it to cover the middle class. And Portland's innovation quadrant has given us a model to build supportive services around a effort to deal with the homeless and low-income folks and middle-class folks. So those four areas look to me, apropos of your good question, where we might be able to break the ice, get some bipartisan progress in 2019. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> Senator Merkley? So I'll try to mention a, a couple other areas that I think there's uh, prospects uh, for uh, good bicameral, bipartisan work. And uh, let me start with the issue of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, this was struck down by the Supreme Court. We saw in this last election all forms of voter suppression across the country. We had a Secretary of uh, State who was running for, for governor who was sitting on big piles of registration forms. We had shenanigans around polling places. Uh, how about if we could get the, the whole country to follow Oregon's vote by mail model? Yeah. <laughs> and Senator Wyden has really been a leader on that vision. We need to push in every way we can to reduce those opportunities for voter suppression. A new Voting Rights Act, it's going to be on the top list of things coming out of the House. Uh, and you're starting to see a significant conversation among Republican colleagues in the Senate that things are just not right, that in a democratic republic we should be for voter empowerment, not voter suppression, including just last week, um, uh, we turned down a candidate uh, for a district judgeship in North Carolina because of his background in voter suppression in Jesse Helms' campaigns. And it took Tim Scott to, to stand up and say this is just unacceptable. But I hear whispers from other Republican colleagues saying it's just unacceptable as well. And you think about it, this goes to the core vision of whether we have we the people government or, or government by and for the powerful. And in that kind of basket, we should try, but I'm not as optimistic, about taking on the dark money in politics and taking on gerrymandering. Those three things would be a big dose of making our government work in the way it was intended. Second, criminal justice. And the reason that this has come up is you have uh, the president weighing in, say he's ready for criminal justice reform. Uh, it was uh, 2016 when we were very close to a bipartisan deal, and now we have President Trump weighing in and we have the Koch brothers weighing in. It's not often that the Koch brothers uh, uh, weigh in in a way that I agree with, but in this case, uh, I do, and that's the foundation for bipartisanship. Find those things that you can work on together. 
And it would vastly reduce a lot of the um, uh, abuses that we've seen in the criminal justice system, and it would free up a lot of money for education and housing and infrastructure as well. I'd like to see us spend money on the front end, making the world work better for families and for business, rather than on the back end, uh, locking people up far more than is merited in a smart criminal justice system. Absolutely. And I have to mention climate, and I'm, I'm so glad Senator Wyden led off on that, because uh, we're really seeing the effects perhaps more than any other state in the country, from our, our oysters and the need to deacidify the Pacific Ocean water in order for them, uh, for the hatchery to, to work, uh, to the pine, growing pine beetle damage in the, in the red zone, the impact on the Cascades snow, and that translates both into winter sports and, and irrigation, uh, the fires having a profound impact. Uh, and so Oregon needs to be deeply engaged in this conversation. At the federal level, I don't think we have the ability to get, if you will, the equivalent of a carbon fee, although we're seeing a lot more business uh, step up and say we, sh we should have that sort of simplicity and market signals. The way we took on uh, acid rain with sulfuric acid uh, in the air could be done, but I don't see that happening. What I do see is lots of other pieces. Tax policy that Senator Wyden will be so well placed on, uh, subsidies for electric uh, vehicles, uh, the ability to, to extend, at least balance out the fossil fuel subsidies with subsidies that, that level the playing field for wind and for solar, uh, for community solar. Uh, we have to work to accelerate the transition from burning fossil fuels to renewables. And now it's smart business to do renewables because the cost per kilowatt hour is now less on renewables than it is on burning coal. And so I hope Oregon can help be in the forefront of that, but nationally we have to seize every piece of the puzzle we possibly can towards the vision of 100% clean and renewable energy. Just very quickly, uh, the Hemp Farming Act. Again, Senator Wyden has worked on it uh, through the authorizing side, I've worked on it through the appropriations side, but we are on the verge, in the farming bill that's about to pass, uh, descheduling uh, hemp, uh, and uh, it is the oil in it, the CBD oil, that is becoming a hugely valuable commercial uh, product, and uh, we are seeing that spring up all over Oregon, so it can be very good for Oregon ag. Also on the cannabis side, uh, I'm going to keep pursuing, and I've had bipartisan support for the Safe Banking Act to enable the cannabis economy to operate within the banking system rather than outside of it. And uh, I'm just going to stop there giving time. Well, those are wonderful things to hear about. Um, we just talked a little bit about your committees. Senator Wyden, you serve as the ranking member of the Senate Finance Committee, and Senator Merkley, you serve as on the Senate Appropriations Committee. These committees are arguably two of the most important in the Senate, uh, which makes us very excited. But what do you see as your role moving forward, and what do you think we can expect? You talked a little bit about out of those committees, but what do you think we should expect from your committee? I, I think in the Finance Committee, where of course we'll get the trade legislation, I think we're gonna talk about that before we're done, up at the top of the list is healthcare, and healthcare costs, healthcare costs continue to gobble up everything in sight. This is really the Achilles heel of the current healthcare landscape and all of the past um, legislation. And I think the way the year is going to work is we're going to have to play some defense because, as you know, the administration is in federal court. They want to unravel protections for those with pre-existing conditions, cancer and diabetes and asthma and this kind of thing, Oregon has tried to take some steps to protect those folks. But the problem is, if the administration is successful and strikes the Affordable Care Act altogether, people won't have the money to be able to afford those services. So we're going to play some defense. We also are faced with an effort to sell junk insurance which isn't worth the paper that it's written on. Reminds me of the days when I had a full head of hair and rugged good looks and I was director of the Great Panthers. <laughs> and we were fighting junk insurance and now it's back. 
So we plan some defense. Here are the two areas we're going to play offense on. The first is going to be prescription drugs. And I think we all understand those bills as well are going through the roof. Uh, the new chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, Charles Grassley, and I led an investigation into hepatitis C where we saw the price gouging. So he has a history of being interested in these issues. One of the areas I'm going to target with respect to price gouging on pharmaceuticals is the middlemen. And the middlemen are driving up so much of the health care bill in this country. There's people, maybe some folks here, pharmaceutical benefit managers. Might have made sense decades ago. They had the data, they had the expertise. Doesn't make much sense anymore. We don't know what they're putting in their pocket and what they're putting in yours. So we're going to be playing offense there, and we're going to play offense on something you're going to hear a lot about. And that is the Medicare program is undergoing a massive transformation. Medicare is no longer primarily about acute illness, like if you broke your ankle or you got a horrible case of the flu. Today, Medicare is about chronic illness. It's about cancer and diabetes and heart disease. This is going to be 80% of the Medicare spending. Both political parties, and I want to emphasize this, both political parties missed what went on with Medicare in the last 15, 20 years. And Orrin Hatch, he's the Republican senator who's retiring, and I got a major piece of legislation passed to begin this transformation. More care at home, expansion of telehealth, which is important for Oregon, more non-physician uh, providers. Uh, in Oregon, the Medicare Advantage plans, which are predominantly in the metropolitan area, are very well positioned to be leaders in this area. The issue to watch on the domestic side, in addition to international trade and taxes, is the effort to stop going backward on health care and actually on a bipartisan way going forward. That would be great. <laughs> Senator Merkley. Well, so shifting from the Finance Committee to the Appropriation Committee, uh, the, the big picture actually shows some significant improvements in the appropriations process in the Senate. There was a bipartisan deal uh, to keep poison pill policy issues off of the, the subcommittee bills. Uh, I'm the ranking member, the top Democrat on the Ag Subcommittee. We worked very hard to implement that vision, and virtually all of the appropriation bills, there are 12 of them, made it through the Senate and off to conference. Half of those have made it to the president's desk. The other half have not. And the, you know, I'd like to say as a member of the Senate, uh, it's the House that was the problem. And uh, so, because they still want to put, they haven't reached the same bipartisan agreement to try to keep the poison uh, pills out of uh, controversial policy issues off the appropriations. So we're, that result is that half the government uh, is going to be on the verge of shutting down on December 7th. So we have to go back in the next few days and we have to get a spending bill passed. Uh, as I understand it, there's a proposal that came up uh, just over the weekend with uh, President Bush's uh, death uh, that we may have uh, just a two-week extension, which means we get the joy of going right back after Christmas to try to uh, resolve those remaining uh, six appropriation bills. The appropriation process is full of opportunities for Oregon, and I thought I would just mention a, a few of those battles that have occurred uh, that I've been involved in. Money for, to help take on sudden oak death uh, research for the southwest coast. If sudden oak death makes it up to Coos Bay, it could have a huge impact on our nursery uh, stock uh, exports. Uh, funding for irrigation districts to, to pipe their, their canals, um, and uh, why, why you can't put in earmarks, but you can put in programs that are designed specifically for circumstances. And so I was able to get a $50 million program for piping related to irrigation districts struggling with an endangered species issue. Half that money has come to Oregon for the last several years, and I hope to see it continue to come, not just to Central Oregon, dealing with the spotted frog, uh, but also uh, to uh, the Klamath Basin that's, that's wrestling with uh, a series of um, challenges with uh, the sucker fishes, the different breeds of sucker fish. 
Mass Timber, this is an exciting business opportunity for Oregon. So I've been able to get funding to go to do the infrastructure necessary. And that, by that I mean the, the testing and design and engineering that allows you to move things into the building code and into the operation. Uh, we're going to see, be able to visit the new uh, Oregon State University uh, College of Forestry that's going to be built with Mass Timber. Albina Yard already built. Uh, we are seeing uh, the DITAS new headquarters going to use mass, uh, components of mass timber. We have both the, the uh, CLT that DR Johnson has been doing, the cross laminated timber. We also have the mass uh, plywood panels that Ferreras Brothers, they, and they have an incredible new factory ready to just amplify their production as the opportunities occur. Uh, port dredging, critical to our coastal economy. I've been able to get a set aside for small ports that has really helped with that dredging to keep those ports in operation. Uh, housing vouchers and forest thinning, uh, significant funds in, in both of those areas. Uh, so um, those are the types, that's just a short list of like 50 things that have affected Oregon. So whatever aspect of business you're in, if there's something in the spending bill that affects it, please weigh in with my team. I do want to echo the importance of taking on uh, uh, drug pricing. And uh, we're going to go at this so many different directions. Senator Wyden, as he mentioned, is targeting the middleman structure. Uh, I'm putting forward an idea called the Low Cost Drugs Act that essentially says most of these drugs are based on research that we fund as Americans. The Canadians don't fund it, the Europeans don't fund it. So this bill, and it's referred to generically as a reference pricing bill, says that you couldn't charge more for a drug in the United States of America than is charged in the sale to Canada or to uh, the largest of the OECD countries. If the price is good enough in those countries, it should be enough here in the United States of America. We are paying a fabulous markup. Uh, Leslie, uh, a man, came to one of the town halls, and his drug for seizures for his child now costs $44,000 a vial. Wow. It is sold in Canada for $200. And so just an example of the tremendous thing. So um, you may have noticed just before Thanksgiving, uh, President Trump said he wants to do reference pricing. And I'm like, great. Uh, well, so there we have another opportunity to work with our president and the Republicans to be able to take on the high cost of drugs. Well, that's wonderful. That's an astonishing cost difference. Um, so I have a few more questions in the time we have left. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the Finance Committee and, and trade playing a key role in trade policy. As you know, Oregon is a highly dependent trade state, uh, and the growing trade war puts many of our industries in jeopardy. What's the outlook on that? Here, here's where we are, folks, and obviously there have been some big developments just in the last couple of days with respect to NAFTA and, uh, and China, and let me just see if I can um, sum them up. Uh, obviously, the stakes are enormous. One out of five jobs in Oregon depends on international trade. The trade jobs pay better than do the non-trade jobs, so what we say is grow it in Oregon, make it in Oregon, add value to it in Oregon, and ship it all over the world. That's our agenda with respect to trade. Now, the ham-handed way in which the White House has handled so much of this has obviously caused a lot of uncertainty for our farmers and our manufacturers and our tech companies and the like. And what I have tried to tell the administration is Trade is really based on a toolbox, a toolbox of various kinds of approaches we might use, and just going with tariffs, in effect, is sort of a one-trick pony that isn't going to win the rodeo. So we're going to have to think this through to a more coherent kind of strategy. What happened, first of all, with China, is they made a deal to talk about making a deal. <laughs> That's what happened over the weekend. And we're hopeful, for example, that it really will be meaningful even in the short term for ag and manufacturing. There have been various kinds of reports about whether um, that would be the case. 
but we still have major enforcement issues. And however you feel about trade agreements, Senator Merkley and I can tell you at every town meeting we go to, people will say, gee, you folks are talking about new trade agreements. How about enforcing the laws that are on the books today? And so a big challenge we have with China is uh, the theft of intellectual property. Uh, often they require our companies who do business in China to give up their technology. We have got to get back in the enforcement business. That relates directly to the reports you're hearing about NAFTA. NAFTA 2.0 does get into some areas that are long overdue. For example, I was one of the ringleaders in getting some technology changes in NAFTA 2.0. NAFTA 1.0 was based on there being no smartphones on the planet. Last time I looked, everybody out there is using their smartphone. People usually use their smartphone when I give speeches. So I get a, <laughs> get a sense of the importance of smartphones. <laughs> but the point is, it needs an update. But it also needs strong enforcement. And Senator Merkley and I are going to be right out in front of that effort. We can't let companies have weak environmental laws, weak labor laws, and take advantage of us. One issue broke this morning, and then we'll close it off, because I think we're trying to describe that we need a coherent, comprehensive strategy rather than just saying we're going to tariff our way to prosperity. We all in Oregon understand a little bit about our history uh, there. Apparently, the president is now threatening to unilaterally withdraw our country from NAFTA. I will be sending this week a copy of the Constitution to the White House because Article 1, Section 8 makes it clear that the Congress of the United States regulates commerce among the various foreign nations. So I want it understood that we welcome your ideas on trade policy. Trade is hugely important uh, to uh, our state. And what I can tell you I'm going to do as a ranking Democrat on the Finance Committee that has jurisdiction over trade, is I'm going to be working for the Oregon way, which is trade done right. All right. So, Senator Merkley, I'd love to talk about infrastructure. What's the possibility of passing a major transportation or water infrastructure funding bill next year? And is there any advice that you have for us in Oregon uh, to be, we should be doing to prepare? Well, to set the stage for this, uh, infrastructure is the, the huge missed opportunity of 2017. You had both parties ready to throw themselves into this. Uh, I met with Elaine Chow early on and asked when she was going to have the, uh, the outline of the, the, the president's plan, uh, and she indicated, well, possibly by, by late summer, or maybe the fall of 2017. We finally did get an outline in early 2018, uh, but Essentially, it was a deeply flawed outline. For one of the things it did is it flipped the 80-20 formula for federal support on its head. And that is, traditionally, on big infrastructure projects, the federal government provides 80% of the funding, and the state or locality combined to provide 20%. And the president's plan flipped that on its head so that the 200,000, 200, excuse me, $200 billion that was anticipated to be put into it would be multiplied by a factor of five, you know, just back of the envelope, oh, a trillion dollar plan. But the fact is, if any locality had 80% of the money, any state had 80% needed, they'd already be doing the project right now, just, you know, slightly uh, tr trimmed down. And so uh, that was the, the missed opportunity. I hope that we can come back to a new possibility uh, of uh, looking at this um, again intensely here in, in 2019, because we know that we have massive infrastructure needs. I'll tell you how frustrating it is to me. I've made a, a, a number of trips to China. I went there when there were bicycles. I went back a few years later, and the, the ring roads had been added around Beijing, and, and cars were choking up every road. I went back again and rode on a bullet train going 200 miles per hour and saw mass transit systems being deployed in city after city after city. 
while we've been sitting still on infrastructure, not even maintaining what we have. We have 54,000 bridges that are rated by the engineering side as structurally deficient in America. And that's just the beginning of the, of the challenge. So we really do, this should be where we can have bipartisan support because it creates jobs now, it builds the foundation for an economy in the future. There is a plan that the Senate Democrats put out that was a trillion dollar plan, a real trillion dollar plan, it's not a five time <laughs> leverage uh, 200 billion. And, uh, and then there's individual bills we're, we're pushing, rural broadband. I pushed for an 11 fold expansion of rural broadband funding and got it, going from 60 million to 660 million. We need to put rural broadband in every small town across America. Absolutely. Water infrastructure, again, outside of a massive infrastructure bill, water infrastructure, clean water supply, wastewater treatment, essential to every community, and so often you have old infrastructure that's worn out or it's not large enough for new commercial activities or for uh, new residential growth. Uh, so I started a program called WIFIA, Water Infrastructure Innovation Act. And WIFIA now uh, is going to fund $5.5 billion of water projects across America this fiscal year, and we're looking at doing the same for the next fiscal year. The uh, third are Tiger Grants that are now called Build Grants. Uh, these have done things like, for example, the Siskiyou uh, Railroad in the south, or uh, the um, uh, Selwood Bridge, or the overpass for our Rivergate Industrial District. Mm -hmm. Those, we need to have more of those. And that can also be done outside a massive infrastructure bill. So let's seize every opportunity we can in each of these programs, and also push for a trillion dollar investment on the whole set of things from rural broadband to water to housing to schools. There's so much that needs to be done in so many areas to build the foundation for our future economy. Absolutely. Okay, well thank you so much. I have one question left for both of you actually. It's about forest management. Senator Wyden, Oregon is very grateful to you and your colleagues to secure to fix this year that provides wildfire funding in a way that stabilizes the budgets of the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. But what can Congress do next to better manage federal forests, to avert catastrophic fires, protect the environment, and support our forest products industry? Any discussion of policy in our state always comes back to forestry. And it's been ever thus, and I think it's right for us to close on this uh, topic. And that is, the fires that we're seeing today are not your grandfather's fires. They are bigger, they're hotter, they're more powerful. Leaping the Columbia River, as was the case not long ago, the fires that we're seeing in California are in effect creating clean air refugees where people cannot even get air to breathe. So we are gonna need to fight this battle on a variety of fronts. And certainly, climate change has contributed to our problems in the woods. It is hotter and it's drier, and you get a lightning strike, and all of a sudden you got an inferno on your hands. So we're going to have to fight this a number of different ways, and I'm going to kind of tick off the elements. In 2020, a bill that Mike Crapo and I wrote, 260 groups, Sir Merkley, very helpful, will end something called fire borrowing. So we'll no longer raid the prevention funds, and that's just, one person came and said to me, gee, Ron, that's too sensible for Washington, D.C. I think they'll actually do it. Well, 2020, it starts. That's why it's great that Senator Merkley and so many are helping us get the additional money to uh, get us to that point. Second, the Forest Service has agreed to my proposal. It is underway now to speed up the process of reducing hazardous fuels. These hazardous fuels that are out there on the forest floor are just magnets for fire. And the day that everybody was celebrating 
the end of fire borrowing, we had the forest service in, and I said, hey, great, we're celebrating. What are we going to do to deal with the backlog? Well, that is now underway as well. Third, we've got to get the science of prescribed burns right. And this is hugely important because this gives you a chance, for example, in the cold or weather, you can look at ways to reduce risk uh, in the summer. We're going to be using drones. We're going to be using GPS systems. We're going to be using sensors. This is going to be a real-time battle, but getting prescribed burn policy right is a third element. Two others. Cellulosic biofuels really look promising, and if you want to get a sense of what it's going to mean to go from pine needles to power, watch Lakeview, because that plant is underway. They're working to get that off the ground. Now, there'll be other pieces of the puzzle. A rural Oregon, southern Oregon in particular, uh, wanted air tankers, additional air tanker support. When Senator Merkley and I met with the Trump administration, that was the first thing I asked about with Senator Cory Gardner. The first thing I said, you've got to help southern Oregon with air tankers. So the two of us are all in on this forestry battle. I can remember, since I'm kind of the Methuselah of the Oregon congressional delegation now, <laughs> Senator Hatfield would have a meeting about forest policy, usually in July. And he would bring us all together and we would talk about fires for a few weeks in August. That is not, folks, what we're dealing with any longer. You can have fires all year round. We saw what happened in Cal California. So for the two of us, Finance Committee, Appropriations Committee, Energy, we are all in. Because on our watch, we're not going to sit by and get our treasures, our land, air, and water destroyed by these enormous infernos. Thanks for the program. Thanks for 16 years. Yeah. It's been an incredible run. Did you have anything? Did you have anything? Well, so this, uh, this challenge uh, is significant, and I just want to reemphasize again how important it was to start treating really big fire years as a national emergency with a FEMA-style funding. And uh, this work that Senator Wyden led to end fire borrowing in the year 2020 uh, deserves an enormous praise, and that's what will happen. We'll now have, we're now included in kind of the FEMA emergency yep. world. Meanwhile, until then, it was important to get as much funding as possible to fight fires. So that's a piece of a battle I've been fighting in, in appropriations. And we've gotten more funds, uh, but uh, even with those now two and a half billion dollars, because of the more extensive fires, we're still running out of funds. But in 2020, that ceiling will drop down to 1.4 billion dollars, which means everything above that will be in the FEMA emergency world freeing up $900 million that I want us to get into of prevention with forest thinning. And I've laid out a Wildfire Resilient Communities Act that puts enormous funding into fuels reduction. It enhances the ability of communities to work, to cooperate with federal government on federal lands to, to, do, to do thinning and, and um, uh, removal of, uh, of uh, fuels from the forest floor. It would permanently authorize the uh, Collaborative Forest Landscape Program that Oregon's been a leader on and has been doing much more landscape equivalents of stewardship uh, projects to be able to keep out of the court and bring the environmental world and the timber world together. And then it would also do a 25% fee. It would set up a, a county stewardship fund because one of the complaints about stewardship contracts and uh, collaborative forest landscape is the traditional 25% that would go from a regular timber sale to the county doesn't exist in that. So we're adding a 25% on in a separate fund to be able to provide that so every action in the forest, whether it's a traditional timber sale or it's a stewardship agreement or collaborative forest action, all would provide funds to assist the local communities with that 25% number. So that's just a few of, of those pieces. And I think by that last point, 
That is the exactly type of thing that comes up in our town halls all the time. Mm -hmm. A local issue, why can't we do it differently? And then Senator Wyden and I try to say, well, let's try to change it. And time after time, we're, we're able to. So uh, thank you all for assembling to take on the, the vision for our economy, our business community, really the quality of our state and our nation going forward. It's a, a privilege to participate with you. Thank you. Well, thank you both for everything you do for us and for being here today.